right, now it's time for the children's sermon this time. If they'd like to come up. Let's see if I can see any of these. Hang on a second. There you go. See if you recognize any of these folks. There we not him. Where are they at? That is not working. Well, anyway, we went to an exciting dance recital yesterday. All right. All right. Somewhere in there. All right. Um, leave that up for a second. All right. Y'all ready for your riddles this morning? All right. Well, very good. And uh, all right. What is red, white, and blue in Christmas time? What's red, white, and blue in, during the Christmas season? All right. It's a sad candy cane. Oh. All right. And where does this, what does a snowman eat for breakfast? Anybody know? What's that? I heard somebody say something. Y'all know this one. All right. Frosted flakes. Ah. Uh, all right. All right, we're looking at the Christmas story, and today we're going to look at a Christmas story that took place after the shepherds were there, and who came after the shepherds? Do you remember? The wise men, that's right. And so the wise men came, and they brought their gifts, and you know what they did after they brought them? They worshiped baby Jesus. And uh, Christmas is special. It's a time we remember when Jesus came, but then there's a day after Christmas when all the gifts have been opened, and you still have maybe the tree up and stuff, but Christmas is, is over with, the day of celebrating, but it's also still a day to worship Jesus. And we're going to look today about, about what took place after the wise men left and what we need to do every day because of the Christmas season. All right. All right. Uh, hope it's okay. All right. All right. Let's sing one more song. Somebody had a birthday this week, so we'll remember her. That's Miss Linda. Miss Linda had a birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to her. Y'all want to help me? Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Linda. Happy birthday to you. All oh, many more. <laughs> All right. God bless you. All right. I think y'all can, all right, y'all head out, children's church. All right. Well, they had a good, uh, let's see where else they had a, all right. Now let me show you. They were acting and dancing and having a good time. Here we go. All right. So turn this way. Come on. There we go. No, turn, turn, turn. Well, forget that. Forget that. Put this other up. And it's still not going to turn right, is it? Okay. We'll try something else next time. Sorry. All right, we're going to look today at the dark side of Christmas and uh, the darker side of Christmas. And the story is going to found, be found in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 13 and following. You've been digging that up. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and following. Christmas is a fun time of year, 
And uh, one of the fun things we enjoy in the Christmas season is the music, isn't it? We love the music. I remember they did a survey of some of the favorite Christmas songs, both carols and, uh, and just kind of contem contemporary or just uh, secular songs. Can you all think of some of your favorite Christmas songs? Anybody have any favorite Christmas songs? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. There you go. That's a good one. That's a good one. That'll be on some people's list. What are some of your all fa other favorites? We Three Kings. We Three Kings. All right. That's a good one. Silent Night. Silent Night. Yeah. Silent Night always ranks up there in the top and uh, is one of the all, all kind of Christmas uh, music together. In fact, they came up with a list of some of the most popular ones and uh, some reason most popular one was, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. For some reason, people like that. And then Silent Night was number two. Uh, and then several others in the top five, even old Holly Jolly Christmas, Burl Ives guy, he's still in the top five. And that little song uh, in Charlie Brown is in there, Winter Wonderland, Let It Snow, Let It Snow. A lot of those are fun. But they also came up with a list of the worst Christmas songs. And uh, some of the worst Christmas songs of all time. And uh, number 10 on that list was a song I actually had uh, on a tape. Not everybody likes him, but I used to really like John Denver. And so I had a lot of his tapes. And I saw one time he had a Christmas album, his uh, collection. I thought, this would be great. And I like him, but it was awful. And one of the songs on there was this, made top 10 on the list. Please, Daddy, don't get drunk this Christmas. And that was number 10 is the worst Christmas songs. Number 9 was Jingle Bell's Boogie. And I actually kind of like this one. It's done by the Barking Dogs, if you've heard that one. Number 8, I don't know why this was so bad. Feliz Navidad. Some folks don't like that. I don't know why. Then another one, I won't pretend to try to pronounce it. It's whatever, you, however you say, Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. Anyway, I've heard that song. And then number 6 was a chipmunk song. People don't like that for some reason. Uh, number five was Wonderful Christmas Time. This was Paul McCartney. Sometimes people don't like that. I don't know why. Number four was Santa Baby by Eartha Kitt. Number three was Last Christmas by Wham. Number two was I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. And what's not on this list, my two least favorites are the one about the donkey and the one about somebody wants a hippopotamus for Christmas. And don't get your kids that, Don. It's not a good thing. And I don't know. Some people love that. It's just not my favorites. But, of course, you know, what is number one, the worst Christmas song ever? That's right. That's right. And I can't understand why they don't like that. But that was number one. Well, Christmas is a fun side, but uh, there's a dark side to Christmas. And that's what we're going to look at today the dark side of Christmas. And uh, the passage we have is from uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. And let's look at that together. And then we're going to look at a corresponding, or at least a passage related to this one, in Psalms 91. We've looked at that lately, but we're going to look at it again. Uh, but Matthew 2, verses 13 through 20. It says, when they had gone, that's the wise men had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. When he stayed there until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. And after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take your child and his mother and go to the land of Egypt, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Now, 
That's the dark side of Christmas that we see, and that is that Satan sought to kill the Savior of the world. He, he wanted to put out the light in this world. He wanted to bring him down, and in process, he wanted to bring us down. And Satan seeks also to bring us down, to hinder our lives and to ruin our lives. And in fact, that's what Christmas is about. It's about God saving us and redeeming us from the curse of sin and redeeming us and protecting us from Satan. And the passage we're going to look at, you can stick your finger in, in Psalms chapter 91. In Psalms 91, and we're going to look today, while there's a dark side of Christmas, Christ came to give us victory in the darkness. And that's what we're going to look in Psalms 91. And Satan attacks us. And some people think, you know, that's not real, but it is. We, there's a satanic influence in the world that affects each, that affects individuals. I was reading uh, not too long ago, and a person was talking about how you can know when you're under sat Satan's attack. And he described it in these ways. He said, there's a heaviness in one's spirit. You feel weighed down. There's oppression that bears down on the mind. It says you uh, end up with wicked, vile thoughts, even suicidal promptings can accompany these assaults. And some people will say, well, that's nothing, that's just yourself. Well, I think it's true. Satan attacks us and hinders us many times. I remember not very long ago, I was looking in a People magazine, and, and uh, sometimes one of the best things in People magazine is when they celebrate the life of someone who lived a good life, lived a long time from the past. Sometimes the new stuff is not so great. But I was looking not at one of the feature articles, but I was reading in a place in the back where they had uh, talking about people that had passed on. And it was not old people that caught their, my attention, people with a long, good life. It was that there was a countless number of people, fairly young, and the same thing was true of each and every one of them. They'd all taken their own life. They'd been in Hollywood. They'd been stars. They'd been... Uh, they'd been uh, uh, managers, producers, they, they filmed in different areas, but many of them had taken their lives and uh, they had felt that life was not worth living. They had felt a heaviness, oppression, and they gave into it. And what we find is that Jesus came to lift us from that and to redeem us for that. And in Psalms uh, chapter 91, we find a psalm that is a victory for us. And in fact, if you'll open up to that today in Psalms 91, you will find a psalm of victory. The psalmist declares, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that strikes in darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift, your, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. We find in here victory in the darkness. Now, what tone of psalm is this? If you look through the t psalm as a whole, you'll see what it is. In verse 1, it talks about shelter. In verse 2, it talks about a refuge and a fortress. In verse 4, it talks about a refuge and a shield. In verse 5, it talks about terror by night, arrows by day. 
In verse 6, it talks about pestilence and destruction. It talks about a thousand may fall. In verse 9, it talks about refuge. In verse 11, it talks about a guard. In verse 15, it talks about rescue and a deliverer. What is the tone for Psalms 91? The tone is warfare, battle, conflict, fighting. It is a song for battle and that it conveys in an atmosphere a daily oppressive enemy attack. And some days and some weeks, that's what life feels like, isn't it? A daily attack, right and left, all over the place. We get attacked in all kinds of ways. We feel put down. Now the question is, who is the enemy? In verse 3, it talks about he's the trapper, the fowler's snare. In verse 8, it says he's the wicked. In verse 10, it says he's evil. In another translation, it says he's the one who brings harm. Now, to order overcome this enemy, we are provided with angelic assistance in verses 11 and 12 and divine deliverance in verses 14 and 15. Now, who is this enemy? Only one enemy would require that kind of intervention. So who is it? It is Satan. It is Satan. It is the devil and all his demons. Now, since Satan is supernatural, then we were provided with supernatural help. Now, another sign this enemy is Satan is found in verses 5 through 7. Well, we're provided uh, full protection. In no other realm except the spiritual realm could we claim to have such absolute protection and deliverance. Satan is on the attack, but don't be fooled. Don't be lured into complacency. Satan is out to destroy your life, your children, and the ministry of our church. And just like he was out to take the life of baby Jesus in Jerusalem, he is out to destroy us. Now, here is how to find victory over the one who desires to ruin your life. What is the first thing that you need to do? In verses 1 through 4, it talks about that we need to run for protection. One of the great verses of Scripture at any age is uh, 2 Timothy 2.21, where it talks about flee the evil desires of youth. Uh, we need to flee but we don't need to run away from something. We need to run to something. We need to run to protection. And there are times when we're in trouble. I remember uh, when I first came to Montgomery, the first spring that I was here, uh, I grew up, there were all kinds of weather dangers, but we didn't have tornadoes much. And so we had a tornado coming through Montgomery. It's coming down through the, uh, uh, the uh, eastern bypass. And, uh, and so I was listening to the radio, and I was doing what they said. And they said, go to the center of your house, grab a mattress, and put yourself in that mattress. And so I sat in the corner of my house and with my mattress until they told me it was safe to go. You know, sometimes you need to go for protection. And sometimes we're naive as to the trouble that we're in. I remember when I was going away to school, I used to drive from New Mexico to Missouri, and I'd go through New Mexico and cut through part of Texas and Oklahoma, and then come up to the corner of northwest, uh, northeast corner of Oklahoma into Missouri and go to school. And uh, it was places I'd really never been before, and uh, some places at least. And you know, when you're driving through places and they're talking on the radio, they talk about counties. They keep saying that a bad storm is coming. They were, they, as I was driving up through Oklahoma and getting close to Missouri, they kept talking about all these counties having a terrible tornado. And I thought, that's horrible. And, uh, and, you know, when you're driving, I don't know the names of counties in other states. I don't even know if I know all the names of the counties in Alabama. And so I kept driving. They kept telling me there's a terrible tornado in this certain certain county. And I was just thinking to myself, somebody would be a dummy to be dry out driving with a tornado if a tornado was close. And then finally, they quit telling the name of the uh, county, and they said the name of the town that it was closest to. And then I looked at a sign, and I said, that's this town. I didn't know. I was, I was just running, running with the tornado the whole way. Sometimes we're in trouble, and we don't even know it. And, uh, and we're trouble. We're in danger in this world. We are not removed from the presence of evil. A lot of times we say, are saved. The Lord, you know, loves me, so everything should be hunky-dory. 
but that's not even what Jesus prayed. If you remember the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed for us in John 17. And what did he say? In John 17, 15, he said this, I do not ask you, he's talking to God about us, to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Jesus said, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world. I'm asking you just to protect them from the evil one. God's plan was for insulation, not for isolation. He means for us to live in a hostile, wicked, non-Christian world system. That's why we look around the world and we think it's wicked, it's trouble, it's a problem. God wants us to be in the midst of that trouble. But he wants us to be here to be protected all the while. He's called us to frontline Christianity. He's not asked us to be some isolated place. Uh, he's asked us to be where the trouble is. But what about protection? It is possible to be both in the fight and in the fortress at the same time. And verses 1 through 4 hold the answer to that. First of all, in verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, dwell is a key word here. In the Hebrew, it is Joshua, which means to remain, to sit, to abide. There's a permanence to this word. It's something that goes on all the time. You abide all the time. You're always there. Those who dwell with God live continuously in fellowship with God, draw strength from Him, let Him have first place in their life. Those are the people that dwell with God. In verse 1, it says a shelter, which is shathar, which means a cove, a covert, a secret hideaway. It says when you draw close to God, you end up in shelter, in a place of protection. Now, don't forget this one truth in Psalms 91. Psalms 91 is written to dwellers. It's not written for protection for everybody. It is written for dwellers. It promises deliverance and protection not to everyone, but to dwellers, to those who draw daily close to God, those who habitually find strength in the Lord. It is for those who seek to be near Him and to keep the lines of communication open. I read a little quote the other day from a fella a little commentary, he says, what is verse 1 actually saying? Simply this, if we who know the Lord Jesus will dwell in conscious fellowship with him, keeping our sins confessed and forsaken, walking with him moment by moment in dependence upon him, we shall enjoy the benefits of living under his protective care on those occasions when rest and lodging are needed. If we maintain our walk with him, we can count on him and his deliverance at periodic times when the going gets rough. Verse 2 says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Refuge is a place of rest. Fortress is a place of defense. Remember, God doesn't provide these things. He is those things. It's not like we can walking along and God just drops some troops around us. God offers his presence for us. That's where they are found. What is our response? Our response must be to trust God. Have you ever heard of Proverbs 3, 5? It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in him, not in your ability, not in your strength, in your wisdom. Trust in him. Verses 3 and 4 tell us what God does for us. It says in verses 3 and 4, For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a rampart. Now, in the New American Standard translation, it says, It is he, it is emphatic. He alone, it is He, no one else, who delivers us, who protects us. Now, one, He delivers us from the snare of the trapper. Remember, this is a promise for those who dwell with Him. If you want to be delivered, you must dwell. Now, this word delivered is a Hebrew word means to snatch away. In Psalms 34, 19, it says, Many are the troubles or the afflictions of the righteous. 
but the Lord delivers them out of them all. In other words, God came, comes, and he snatches us away, and he protects us. Now, what is a snare? Anybody know what a snare is? A snare is a bird trap. Now, for many years, we had a living, breathing bird trap. His name was Smokey. He was our cat. Smokey was a great cat. We loved him. We enjoyed him. Uh, Smokey, though, wanted to get birds and chipmunks and things, and he would lie in wait. He would lie low to the ground, and he would pounce. Now, we had soft hearts at our house, and so we didn't really want him to get the cats and the squirrels and stuff, and so we would protect him from the fowler's snare. And so whenever we saw him about to go, we would yell. We would warn the birds. We would warn the, the uh, chipmunks or whatever were there. And sometimes we would do more than that because sometimes he'd already catch him. I remember one time he had a uh, little chipmunk in his mouth, and he'd got it. And so Morgan was horrified, and so do something. So I went up to Smokey, and I said, drop it. Drop it, and I looked right in his eyes. And he didn't want to, but he dropped it, and it ran away. And so that's what God does for us. Uh, he protects us from the fowler's nest. Webster's translation, I mean, dictionary says snare is this. So listen to what a snare is. Something by which one gets entangled. Something deceitfully attractive. We think about the things in life that draw us in and then we're stuck and we're ruined. They're deceitfully attractive. Satan wants to trap us, to ruin us. But those who dwell are what? God warns them, just like we warned those squirrels and the chipmunks and the birds. And every now and then, uh, God gets us to be dropped out of the jaws of Satan. He just tells him to drop you and to deliver you out of there. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're seeing many examples of people that got caught in the fowler snare. A fellow by the name of Saul, he was king, but he was not faithful to God. He took shortcuts. And he ended up being destroyed. Judas, the Satan, entered him and he gave in. And eventually he hung himself because of his grief and what took place in his life. Satan's ultimate desire is our destruction. He is nothing, never happier than when we are ruined and our lives are ruined. But God can lift us up. Secondly, he covers us with his feathers under his wings. That's what it says in verse 4. A bird keeps close watch over the brood. In Psalms 57 verse 1 it says, Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for in my soul takes, in you my soul takes refuge. It says, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. And that's what a mother bird does. She covers up her little chicks with her wings until the storm has passed. Third, he shields us by his faithfulness. The end of verse 4 says his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. His protection is always there. You can never escape it. He is always there to stand beside you. Now, if that is true, what should our attitude be toward evil? Let's look at, verse, uh, um, look at verses 4, 5, and 6. Of 91. He says, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilent that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Look how the enemy attacks by terror, by arrow, by pestilence, by destruction. Notice that these attacks all take place at any time of the day and night. Our enemy will stop at nothing to make us afraid. But what should be our response? Martin Luther wrote a hymn. The words go like this. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God had willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. We have no fear. What do we have? We have faith. We have faith. That's what it says in, in uh, verses 7 through 10 of this passage in Psalms. We have faith. 
A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. You will make the most hard your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge. Then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. Our Lord expects us to stand firm on his word and his promises and his strength. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the shield of faith. Remember, faith demands an object. In this case, case faith's object is God's written word. If you fail to set your heart upon God's word, you will soon weaken in your resistance and ultimately come, succumb to the traps of the enemy. When Satan attacks, claim these four truths in these four words. What are they? They are the cross. In Colossians chapter 4, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers of the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When we're facing troubles, remember the cross. And then remember the blood. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Paul says this, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Remember the blood that was shed for you. Remember also, thirdly, his name. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Paul says this, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And finally, we need to remember his word. In Matthew chapter 4, as Jesus was facing the temptations of Satan again and again in verse 4, verse 7, and verse 10, what does he do? He quotes scripture. When you're under attack, you need to turn to the cross, to the blood, to the name, and to the word. Have faith, and you will be as bold as a lion. That's what it says in Proverbs 28.1. It says, The wicked man flees, though no one pursues him, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Finally, there's assistance against the evil one. That's what we find in verses 11 and 13 through 13 of Psalms 91. It says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up, you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. We have assistance and against evil. We need supernatural help against Satan in dealing with a supernatural enemy. There's three words about angels. One, in verse 11, he says he will give his command or his charge. It's a Hebrew word, means to appoint, to install, to give command of. You see, angels are actually appointed to us, given command of certain individuals. In Matthew 18, verse 10, Jesus says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. He says, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. Children have their own angels appointed to them. In Acts chapter 12, verse 7, we find that uh, God sent an angel to Peter to release him from prison. Secondly, angels guard. That's what it talks about in verse 11. They guard us in all our ways. The Hebrew word shamar means to keep, to watch over, to observe, to preserve, to take care of. And third, verse 12 says they bear you up. Nasha means to lift, 
to carry, to take up, to support, to sustain. One of my favorite stories is the story of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. And uh, his servant went out where he lived in Dothan, not down in Alabama, but uh, there in the Middle East. And he saw that they were surrounded by the armies uh, of the uh, Armenians. And, uh, and then Elisha went out and looked and simply said, there's no trouble. And the uh, servant said, you're crazy. And he prayed and says, Lord, open up his eyes. And then suddenly he saw, opened up his eyes and surrounding. They, sure enough, the Armenians were still there in all their brutality. But behind each and every one of them was the armies of God, flaming chariots of fire. They bear you up. They protect you. And finally, in verses 14 through 16, we find security from evil. We find security from evil. It says in verse 14, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will, give, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him, and I will show him my salvation. God declares six I wills, and I like these. He says, I do, will do what? I will deliver him or rescue him. I will set him securely on high. Third, I will answer him. Fourth, I will be with him. Fifth, I will rescue him. And sixth, I will satisfy him. Why does God do this? Verse 14 says, because he has loved me. When you love God, when you seek for him, when you search for him, God does that for you. God does this for those who love him. The word love here has a sense of attaching itself to. It's not just you admire. It's not just you love from afar. It means you go wherever they go. You love them so much, you follow them. You may be a stalker. You follow them. The idea has something uh, is akin to it as something to a saddle being attached to a horse. Wherever the horse goes, the saddle's going. You love God, so wherever God goes, you go. The Lord, I wills are not for everybody. They're for who? Dwellers. Those who are clinging on to God. Those who by faith wrap themselves around the Savior. Christmas is about wrapping your life around God. Seeking His forgiveness. Seeking His will. Seeking His love and His provision. You can get your life wrapped up in all kinds of things, can't you? Things that will distract you, things that will ruin you. But if you wrap up your life in Jesus, if you become a dweller, then you will find his peace and his grace and his protection. And you will find the true meaning of Christmas. And you will be protected from the dark side of this world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to deliver us and that we can seek you and know you and feel your presence and your love. And Lord, there may be someone here today discouraged, maybe oppressed, brought down by the attacks of Satan and the weariness of the struggles of this world. Lift their hearts today. Help them to know that if they will simply cling on to you, you'll give them peace and joy. And though you won't take them out of the troubles of this world, you will give them victory in this world. Help us all to seek that and to share that, Lord. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a brief time of invitation. If you need someone to lift you up in prayer today, we're here for you. We want to stand beside you and encourage you in every way that we can. If you need to make a decision for the Lord today, this is the time to do it. If you need Him as your Savior and Lord, we'd be thrilled to lead you in prayer for that. If you need to come, want to come and be a part of our fellowship and join us, we'd love to have you support you in that. Or if you just need someone to pray for you. Let us stand at this time. Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 309, Lord, I'm Coming Home. Join us in standing at this time.
That was great. All right, great to see you all here today. Hope you can come back and join us at 5 o'clock. We'll have a great time together and have lots of food. So come and bring an appetite. Our closing chorus is hymn number four, To God Be the Glory. Well, praise the Lord, and let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus, our Son. The glory, great things hath done. God bless you all.